Welcome to our second lecture covering chapter four. In this chapter, we'll talk about hospitality contracts basics. Uh, when we were last together in, in lecture one, we talked about the introduction to contracts, and we talked about the elements of contracts. And we, we covered the four elements of contract law, those being agreement, consideration, legal capacity, and legal object. In this lecture, we're going to discuss the Uniform Commercial Code, most commonly called the UCC, as well as ways that we can prevent having contractual disputes. So let's go forward to slide 13 to resume our lecture. <clears throat> Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC. Let me give you a little bit of history about the UCC. This isn't a law that's been around forever. I believe that it was first uh, kind of invented or conceptualized in the 1950s. Let's go back in time for a second and think about the world that existed in the 1950s. We had just gotten out, gotten out of World War II, so we as a society had gone through a lot of upheaval. Lots of our citizens had been all over the world exposed to all kinds of different cultures, different economies, different ways of doing things. We were a more cosmopolitan country than we had been just a couple of decades before. <clears throat> we saw that technology was also making significant changes to how we lived. We had um, increased ability to travel. Of course, phones were, were quite common. Uh, basically, uh, the vast majority of our country had been electrified at that point, so people had access to um, uh, things like uh, televisions and radios and things like that. So we were more united in terms of, of the media that we consumed. Uh, our road system was becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, uh, uh, things like uh, um, interstate highways were, were being developed, and uh, certainly the, the airplane industry was taking off. It was no longer, uh, it was more of a commercial undertaking than it had been in previous years. And so uh, the, the means by which people from one state could interact economically with people from another state were growing significantly uh, greater. There was much more interstate commerce, interstate connection with other people. People were more interested and more willing to kind of get beyond the little bubble of their community and branch out into these new parts of the world. But this presented some challenges. Um, back, we'll say, we'll go back to say 1850. <clears throat> um, the world that we lived in at that point, if we were living in Texas, would have been that uh, travel very far from our home was pretty dangerous. Um, there weren't uh, much in the way of developed roads. There wasn't much, there certainly weren't police departments and things along those lines. Um, there were probably still some Indian tribes um, uh, that, that might have caused some concerns at times. Um, even if it were safe to travel, it was difficult to travel. Um, there were dangers associated, you know, everything from snake bite to having the wheel of your of your wagon break off, and then you might be stranded someplace far from home. You didn't have a cell phone. You didn't have a telephone. You didn't have really any means of letting family and and friends know that you were in distress. And so as a result, most commerce was pretty local. If I were a farmer, I was probably selling to my neighbors. If I had eggs, I might sell eggs and I might get some, some beef in, in exchange from one of my neighbors who had a cattle farm, cattle ranch. Um, <clears throat> There would be some interstate commerce, but probably it wasn't uh, something that uh, was a major part of how we did business. But now let's fast forward to the 21st century. Almost everything that we buy has in some sense been touched by interstate commerce. Um, the, uh, even if the, the food that we buy was grown in Texas, it probably traveled in a truck that was manufactured, not in Texas. And it, perhaps the driver of the truck was from a different state, and perhaps the owner of the company that had the trucking service was incorporated in a different state. Um, the uh, uh, chemicals, the pesticides, and, and other things that were sprayed upon the, uh, the produce that I ate um, was probably from a different state. 
and the store in which I bought the produce was probably uh, not necessarily a Texas corporation. Uh, the employee who uh, checked me out may have been born in a different state. And so it's pretty hard to have too many transactions in Texas today that is truly just a Texas transaction. Um, again, this is a huge change from what we would have seen even 100 years ago. So back, well, let's go back 100 years to the early 1900s. Um, each state had its own commercial legal system. There were a lot of similarities between states um, because uh, the, the legal system that developed was, was a codification of kind of the common law ideas that existed. And so since we all, other than Louisiana, have that tradition from Great Britain of the common law, there were a lot of similarities between, but there were also some important differences. And so if I'm doing, if I'm a Texan doing business with an Oklahoman, probably there are some differences between Oklahoma commercial code and Texas commercial code. Well, whose law controls? If I'm buying something from the Oklahoman, does the Oklahoma law apply or does the Texas law apply? You can see it's immediately unclear. And whenever you have a gray area where there's uncertainty, that's not a good place for business. Business wants to know what the rule is. I mean, that's good for efficiency because if you know what the rule is, usually, I mean, you almost don't even care what the rule is. You just want to know because you can then vary the terms of the contract to address that rule. Let's say in a particular state, um, this wouldn't be a rule, but let's just make a rule up. Let's say that the, the buyer automatically has a 10-day period to return the item, no questions asked. Well, if that were the rule, the seller is at a disadvantage because he has to be able to take the stuff back. So how is he going to respond to that? Well, he's going to charge a little bit more money for that item. Once he knows what the rule is, he can adjust his business model to uh, uh, respond appropriately to that particular legal expectation. But if he's not sure, well, do I have to take it back in those 10 days? Because that's the rule in Oklahoma. But in Texas, there is no such rule. He's not sure what he has to do. If he makes the wrong choice, he may, he may end up taking back stuff he didn't really need to or he may um, be in violation of the law by not taking back something that he ought to have when he's negotiating the price of the item he's not sure whether to charge that additional amount because he might be seeing this as a no questions ask refund or he might say no I don't think that law applies so you can see how having uncertainty is really worse than either one of the particular answers that we have and so um, that's the, the, the nugget, that's the facts that created um, uh, the UCC. Okay, so um, let's talk about um, how the UCC came to be the law. Well, we start back again in the, in the uh, mid uh, 20th century. And uh, again, legal scholars had identified this problem, this uncertainty that came from having all of these different commercial codes. And so they started thinking, you know what? Why don't we look at all of these co codes and try to find the aspects of each code that is best and then take all these best practices and create, you know, the perfect commercial code if there is such a thing. And in fact, they didn't just look at the 50 states. They also looked at Canada and Mexico and Great Britain and Japan and any other country, any other way of doing business that they thought might be helpful. And they tried to take the best practices from, from on each one of the points that, that they saw. And these best practices um, would reflect the technology that existed at the time, as well as the cultural expectations of the people involved in the business transaction. So just because it's a best practice in the United States would not necessarily mean it'd be a best practice in a, another part of the world. Anyway, so these legal scholars distilled what they thought was the best commercial code, and they called it the Uniform Commercial Code. You may wonder, well, why are they calling it a uniform? They're not dressing up, are they? Well, no. What they mean here is uniform in the terms of sense of consistent, um, uniform practices, not what you're wearing. And so that was one of the major issues that they had. They wanted the, the, the commercial code to be the same across all the different states. And again, while they wanted to come up with the best code, they also also recognize that even if they didn't come up with the best code, 
just having one answer to all these questions was going to be tremendously helpful. So uh, being best wasn't as important as being consistent, being uniform across the country. But the people who came up with this code weren't members of any particular legislature. They were just ordinary citizens. And so once they came up with the code, it didn't suddenly become law that at that moment. Instead, it was going to have to be taken up in each state's uh, legislature. And so what these uh, legal scholars did is they went out to each one of the states and marketed this. They would talk to legislators and say, hey, well, we've got this great idea. And in some states, the state said, oh, this is great. We're going to adopt it just as is. We think this is really going to help our state compete economically. And will, our business leaders will be very pleased to see this. In other states, the state had the power to say, oh, this just doesn't make sense for us. We already like our commercial code and we're just going to pass on it. And then other states could say, we like certain parts of it, but other parts not so much. And so they could kind of pick and choose the parts that they liked. And what happened is, is that that last choice, the third choice is the one that most states probably adopted. Um, probably most states adopted anywhere from say 90 to 97% of the commercial code. So for the most part, it was adopted virtually everywhere. The only state that hasn't adopted the vast majority of the commercial code is Louisiana. And of course, the reason why Louisiana hasn't adopted is because it is a civil code jurisdiction. You may recall back uh, when President Je Jefferson was president, he purchased the Louisiana Purchase from France in 1803. Um, uh, of course, Napoleon was the emperor of France at the time, and he had already developed the Napoleonic Code, the, that comprehensive civil code system that still exists, obviously, in a very... Um, um, uh, amended form in much of continental Europe. And of course, we had that in Louisiana. And when Louisiana became a part of the United States, uh, the Louisianans decided to keep the code and not adopt a common law uh, system. Um, and so as a result, they are primarily a civil code system. Well, it's not that surprising then that they opted out of the UCC option because the UCC is based upon the common code. It's not based upon the, the uh, Napoleonic civil code. And so as a result, really different terminology, different legal expectations were present in the um, uh, civil code versus the UCC. So other than Louisiana, though, most of the states, in fact, the vast majority of states have adopted the vast majority of the UCC, including Texas. And this makes uh, uh, interstate commerce a brief. Uh, so if you're Amazon, say, or Walmart, and you are in all 50 states, you don't really have to worry about, oh, now, wait a second, we're entering into a transaction with somebody from Wisconsin. What are the rules in Wisconsin? Oh, wait a second, the next person in the queue is from Florida. Well, what are the rules in Florida? Well, how about that Massachusetts person? He's next. You don't have to worry about that because guess what? In all those jurisdictions, they're going to have the UCC so you know what the rules are. You don't have to spend a lot of time knowing 50 set of rules. You can just pretty much know one, maybe with a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a footnote for Louisiana. So here are the goals that the UCC had. First was to simplify, clarify, and modernize the law regarding commercial transactions. Simplify by having one answer for at least 49 of the 50 states. Modernize it to reflect the, the technologies and the cultural values that existed today. Also, the UCC was to permit the continued expansion of commercial transactions to make things easier. You know, back in 1850 or, or at that point in time, transactions typically were relatively small, uh, vendor to vendor or vendor to customer. Uh, they didn't involve huge amounts of money because there weren't these conglomerates that maybe we have today. Um, uh, but uh, the UCC supports many of the huge, huge transactions that might exist. When Walmart purchases, you know, 10,000 uh, lawnmowers or 100,000 eggs or something along those lines um, and have a con has a contract that's going on for years and years, the UCC is able to support those types of transactions in a way that maybe individual state codes just weren't prepared for simply because they hadn't seen those types of transactions before. And then the final goal is to provide for consistency in the law regarding the sale and financing of personal property in the various jurisdictions. So this is consistency so that we have the same answer everywhere. Okay, so let's um, go to our next slide. Okay.
move this down a little bit here. Okay, so this is our definition for the UCC or Uniform Commercial Code. It's a model code, model statute. Whenever you see the word model, that's just a different word for uniform. A standardized document. This is a model, this is an example that again, these private citizens developed. And if you think about a, a if let's say you make um, airplane models, you know, you put all the little pieces together, you glue it together with uh, uh, glue and you have this smaller version of, of whatever the bigger thing is, well that's a model, right? Well a statute here is a model, it's, it's the perfect example of that uh, concept that the people create and then it's sold or it's marketed out to the various states and they work from this model. I mean they might make some changes, they might add some features or take some features away, but that's the idea when we see the word model here. So the UCC is a model statute covering things such as the sale of goods and uh, this is the big thing for us probably. Credit, that can also be a big thing in the hospitality business, and bank transactions. All states have adopted the UCC with the exception of Louisiana, and even Louisiana has adapted, adopted parts of it. So there's, obviously this is a very complex statute, um, but here are just some high points, some brief ideas to get exposed to. One is that the sale of goods over $500 has to be reduced into writing. The writing requirement is very modest. You know, it can be emails, it can be lots of different things, but you have to have some type of written record of any sale of goods. And when we use the word goods, we mean stuff. Stuff you can touch. Um, if I go out and buy paper clips, that's a good. If I go out and buy um, a loaf of bread, that's a good. Um, that's what we're talking about when we talk about goods. So if I buy $500 worth, I guess $501 worth of paper clips, that a transaction has to be in writing under the UCC. Another thing to keep in mind the UCC says is that the seller must provide non-defective goods. I mean, that just kind of makes sense. If I'm selling you a loaf of bread, you are expecting to be able to eat that loaf of bread, that it's not full of mold or, or other things that loaves of bread ought not have in it. And if I sell it to you and you discover that in fact it was defective, that it had some non-food items in it, for example, um, you would be able, I would, you'd be able to sue me for giving you a defective good. Finally, the buyer must inspect and pay for conforming goods. And so this is when the good is um, non-defective. So conforming is the same thing as non-defective. So the good conforms to the terms of the contract. And of course, if I sell you a loaf of bread, implicit in that term bread is it's something edible. You know, if, if, it, if it looks like bread, but it's all moldy inside, it's um, a defective good. It's not conforming to what um, you understood you wanted to purchase when you entered into the contract for the sale of bread. But the buyer has an obligation to inspect it to see if it's conforming. He can't just buy it, uh, file it away without opening it, and then six years later open it up and say, hey, wait a second, that loaf of bread is moldy now. Well, duh, six years later, of course it's moldy, but it may well have been in good shape at the time that you first got that loaf of bread. So the buyer has to promptly inspect the items, and if they are conforming goods, has to pay for them, whatever that contractual price is. So these are some pretty common sense rules that we see in the UCC. No big surprises here. Obviously, there's a lot more to the statute than that, but this is just an introduction to some of the um, uh, maybe more important aspects of the statute. We've all heard the expression caveat emptor. It's a Latin expression. It means let the buyer beware. And the idea is that somehow the law really sets things up to be the advantage of the seller. And so the buyer has to be very suspicious. Well, that used to be the standard in some parts of the, of, of the, the world, but really it hasn't been the standard for quite a while. Well, that doesn't mean that you, you as a buyer shouldn't be careful. You shouldn't be cautious. Maybe you should even be a little skeptical. But generally speaking, the buyer is pretty protected in our legal system under the UCC and also under various other uh, laws. Uh, and it makes sense that the buyer is pretty protected because after all, the seller is in the best position to have information. If I'm selling you a loaf of bread, I know how I made the bread. I know whether I used high quality ingredients. I know whether I've maintained this in an appropriate temperature and an appropriate humidity to uh, frustrate the development of various molds and things along those lines. You don't know 
what's in that loaf of bread until you cut out cut it open and um so you have to kind of trust me well if you can't trust me if caveat emptor is a real situation uh, you're going to be very reluctant to buy a loaf of bread from me well of course as a practical matter that's not the way the, the rule works if you cut open that loaf of bread and you see that there's mold in it um you can go ahead and, and take action against me. Uh, you, the, the rule of let the buyer beware doesn't really apply in the United States. And of course, if I have breached the contract with you, if you do buy the loaf of bread and it's moldy, I have probably breached my contract. And this means I have failed to keep the promises of the contract. If we go back to our four elements of contract law, we just flip back here for a second. We had an agreement. Whatever those terms of the agreement are, the parties have to honor it. Um, so if I agree to sell you my car for $10,000, um, I need to provide the car to you. If I don't ever deliver the car to you, then I am in breach of the contract. If I deliver the car to, to you, but you only pay me $9,000, you're in breach of that agreement. And so both parties have to do what they said that they are, were going to do. And if they don't, then they are in breach of the contract. When somebody breaches a contract, especially if it's a major breach, the other party has the opportunity, if, if he or she wants to, to sue over that breach. Um, and, and that's because the, the non-breacher has a various and sundry legal remedies available to him or her to respond to that breach of contract. Um, so when we think about a contractual breach, one of the first things that legal professionals think about is what are the damages? How was the non-breacher injured as a result? So let's imagine it works this way. So I'm selling you my car. We've negotiated a price of $10,000. I deliver the car exactly as I said I would, would and you give me a check for $9,000. Um, you say, I will drop off a check for an extra $1,000 in 30 minutes. Uh, so I give you the, the keys to the car, you go about your business, 30 minutes comes and goes, you don't deliver the extra check for $1,000. A few days passes, you still haven't paid me my $1,000. I contact you, hey, where's my 1000 bucks? You don't answer my calls. So I, my damages as a result of this are pretty obvious. You were supposed to pay me 10000 you only paid me 9000 you owe me $1,000. Pretty easy to do that math. Those would be my damages. And as a result, my remedy for that, which is the term we have here, would be what I would be seeking in my lawsuit, what would solve my problem would be for you to pay me those $1,000. When we think about the word remedy, many times we think about a medicine. What's the remedy for a chest cold? Well, maybe it's to drink chicken soup. Maybe it's to ha get an antibiotic. Maybe it's to um, uh, get into a hot shower. Lots of different uh, treatments might work. A remedy is a treatment that's designed to help solve whatever that problem is. Well, in the law, we use the term in a similar way. A remedy is what's going to solve the problem of the non-breacher. It's going to get that person, the non-breacher, back into the position he would have been in if the other person hadn't breached the contract. And so the idea of damages and remedies are very closely connected. So we're going to look at some of the remedies that are available to the non-breaching party, the party that did everything that he or she was supposed to under the terms of the contract. And we're just looking at a few of these options. This is by no means an exhaustive list. So one would be a suit. When we say suit here, we mean a lawsuit for specific performance. So let's say that I hire a, uh, I, uh, I go to your business and you have an embroidery shop and you embroider towels. I bring in 10 towels and I want you to put my initials in. them. And my initials are CFG. Well, the person who does the embroidery does the wrong initials. They do ABC as the initials. I don't want my towels to have ABC on them. That's not what I sought. So when you deliver the towels back to me, I might see you for specific performance. I might say, you need to deliver my towels with the correct embroidery in it. You need to fulfill the specific things you told me you would do in the contract. Under this circumstance, I'm not seeking money. I don't want my, my money refunded to me. I want the towels that you promised me I would have, the towels that would say CFG on them instead of ABC. Um, that, this uh, category, this is suit for specific performance, is not a rare one, but that's probably not the most common. Probably the most common uh, way that we see people sue under these circumstances are going to be a suit for an economic loss. This is when you say, look, I want money. 
right? That's what the, the world wants money, right? So going back to the example of the car situation, a specific performance would, or uh, economic damage would be pay me the extra thousand bucks. You could also say that's a suit for a specific performance because that's the part that he hadn't yet performed. He was supposed to pay me 10,000. He's only paid me 9,000. So he should specifically perform paying me that extra thousand dollars. But probably most people look upon that as an economic loss situation. You owe me a thousand dollars. You need to pay that to me. Sometimes, and, and, and wisely, people enter into contracts will often provide, <clears throat> excuse me, in the terms of the contract, what the damages will be in the case of breach. Um, so going back to, let's say, um, let me give you this hypothetical. Um, you are a hotel manager, and I come to you and I say, I'm going to get married in six months. <clears throat> and it's on this particular date, and I... Um, I want to uh, rent this particular ballroom in your hotel. <clears throat> and um, we enter into a contract. We, we uh, establish all the details. But let's say that I cancel at the last moment. And for whatever reason, y'all didn't get a sufficiently large deposit. So now you want to sue me over that. Well, it might be hard to prove exactly what your damages are. Uh, maybe you were able to uh, rent that space to another business, but um, as a result of renting it, because we had to do a last minute thing, as a result of renting the space to another business, um, there were some problems with it. You don't ordinarily rent out the space to this particular type of customer because this customer maybe is very noisy. Maybe it was a band or something. And so you got some complaints from some of the uh, uh, people staying at the hotel. It's hard to quantify the uh, level of, of uh, poor customer service that you provided by having this noisier band uh, performing um, because you are you know, ha renting the space because uh, of the last minute cancellation of the uh, 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 ballroom. It's hard to quantify that. So what you might have done is you might have provided in the contract a liquidated damages provision. You might have said, look, um, if you cancel, say in the last 30 days before the wedding, you are going to owe this amount. If you cancel three months before, you're going to owe this other amount. The other amount would be smaller because the, the hotel has a greater chance of being able to rent that space out to somebody else. But if you cancel, say, in, uh, a week before the wedding, you're probably not going, you're probably going to have to pay the whole amount because the odds are the hotel's not going to be able to rent out a ballroom in less than a week's notice. So a liquidated damages provision provides what the damages are. And the goal here is to be predictive. I mean, none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know. I mean, it could be. You're the hotel manager. You get the call. The wedding is off three days before the wedding day. And then 10 minutes later, you get a call from some other bride, hey, you know what, my, my, I'm supposed to get married this Saturday and my uh, planned uh, reception uh, building just burned down, can I, can I rent a space from you? It works out perfectly, it's seamless, you're able to slide in this new uh, wedding party um, in exactly the spot that you have. I mean, that could happen, but it's probably not gonna happen, so what you have to do is play the numbers. You have to think, well, what's likely to happen? It's likely that that, that uh, reception hall is just going to be empty, right? And so uh, you, you plan for that. You, you try to predict what are my damages likely to be, and that's what you put into the contract. So liquidated damages are damages whose amount the parties designate bef during the formation of the contract for the injured party to collect his compensation upon a specific breach. Another smart approach, and this can be actually written into the contract or it can be um, something that the parties decide on later, is to resolve the dispute through alternative dispute resolution, which is commonly called ADR. And this is when you resolve the dispute through non-litigation means. I mean, litigation is an awesome thing. It definitely has its role in our legal system, but there are some drawbacks to actually suing over a dispute. One thing is that it's very time consuming. Um, in a Texas state court system, to go from trial through the appeals process can take years and years. Even to get to trial will probably take well over a year. Um, in the interim, you're in limbo. If you are the plaintiff, you've been injured and you're not seeing any financial relief during that time. That's a major problem for many plaintiffs. Another problem with litigation is that it's expensive. Uh, both parties are going to be paying attorneys and when you're not sure if you're going to win or not, and depending upon the particular claims, you, you might have to pay your legal bills even if you do win. Um, it's a pretty expensive undertaking. Um, when I was in corporate 
in the corporate world, it wasn't unusual for corporations to budget a hundred thousand uh, dollars, even for relatively um, insignificant litigation, simply because it costs a lot of money to get sued. Another downside to litigation is that it's not very flexible. Um, the courts are going to determine how the problem gets solved, not the parties. Um, when the two parties are working together to reach a solution, many times the concerns that they have aren't things that courts can address. For example, the courts can't make one side apologize to the other side. The courts can't make the two parties um, enter into another contract that maybe will make the parties happy over the long haul. So it's a less flexible means of problem solving than some other approaches might be. And then the fourth big drawback to litigation is that it's really hard, largely because of the things we've already talked about, but it's really hard for parties to remain civil through this process. It's emotional, it's nerve-wracking, it's expensive, and at the end of the process, usually both sides just despise one another. I mean, it's just a visceral emotional reaction. And oftentimes that's not the best choice. It may be that, yes, these two parties have a dispute, but you know what? It may make sense over the long haul for them to work it out because there may be some economic advantages to both parties to continue the relationship in some mode. Well, it's, it, I mean, it can be done even after litigation, but it's really hard for us to get beyond all those bad feelings. So alternative dispute resolution is a way of uh, lessening some of those downsides to litigation. Now we call it alternative dispute resolution, which makes it sound like it's unusual or rare, but in fact it's not. About 97% of all litigation gets resolved through alternative dispute resolution. So really it's not the alternative, it's the main mainstream way that these disputes get resolved. Litigation is the relatively infrequent. We think of it as the main mode, and I guess it, that doesn't that does make sense because it's usually how a dispute kind of is resolved during the early stages where you know, someone files a lawsuit and then later on people decide to use alternative dispute resolution. And it's also the mechanism that our legal system has established for resolving disputes. But ADR can make a lot of sense. So what is ADR? Now I've been talking about what it isn't, let's talk about what it is. It's resolving the dispute that you have, and this can be related to, to breach of contract or really any uh, civil matter. It's resolving it through some means other than the court system. So it could be mediation. Or it could be negotiation, just the two parties sitting down, together, sitting down together and discussing the problem and coming up with a solution. It could be mediation where you bring in a third party, disinterested, neutral, um, but oftentimes knowledgeable about the particular area of the law that you're, you're dealing with. And the parties can uh, brainstorm with this person and this person can kind of be a good referee and point out weaknesses and strengths in each other's cases. So that can be a relatively inexpensive and quick way of resolving the dispute. Finally, you have arbitration. Arbitration is a bit more involved. It's really like having a private legal system, a private trial. Instead of having a judge and jury, you have an arbitrator who hears the evidence and renders a decision. It is usually less expensive in terms of legal fees. It's quicker. Um, and it can be private in a way that litigation can't be. So those are just some options to, to think about as you are involved in legal disputes. There's other options as well. Those are probably just the, the big ones. Oh, well, here's a definition of um, arbitration. A process in which an agreed upon independent neutral third party, who's called the arbitrator, renders a final and binding resolution to a dispute. The decision the arbitrator is known as the award. So, um, and again, our arbitration is a type of ADR. And here we have a slide about mediation. We've already kind of talked about this. A process in which an appointed neutral third party, who's called the mediator, assists those involved in dispute with, that, with resolving their differences. The result of mediation when successful is known as a settlement. One thing I want to flag about mediation is that the mediator is just um, an, a facilitator of the process. He or she can't dictate the answer. So even if the mediator is is persuaded that the solution to the problem of the two parties is X. He or she can recommend it all day long, but the parties themselves get to decide. 
they can choose not to reach any decision if they want, or they can choose some other choice, something that the mediator doesn't think is best. So the mediator there is to help them or assist them, but he or she has no authority to force them to pick something they don't like. That's the difference between mediation and arbitration. In arbitration, the arbitrator is acting like a judge. He can absolutely resent or she can uh, create a decision that the parties, one or both parties, don't care for. Okay, let's talk about statute of limitations. Um, this is important when, in any type of litigation that you might be exposed to. Is it, Let's say that there's a breach of contract case. We'll go back to the example wherein I'm selling you my car for $10,000, but you only paid me $9,000. Well, if I wait too long to file my lawsuit, I may be against a statute of limitations. So what is the statute of limitations? You've probably heard this. Oftentimes in a criminal context, you know, what's the statute of limitations for murder? What's the statute of limitations for bank robbery? Those types of things. Well, we have that same idea in civil law as well. These are various laws. You're typically going to be state laws that set maximum time periods in which lawsuits must be initiated. If the suit is not initiated, which means filed, before the expiration of the maximum period allowed, then the law prohibits the use of the courts for recovery. This is a date that you need to know. This is the one, oops, sorry, went back here. Uh, let me just flag this here. In Texas, as is true, I think for most states, the statutory period for breach of contract is four years. You do need to know this. This is something you won't find in the textbook, so be sure to flag this um, in your notes. So the statutory period for breach of contract is four years. Um, so if I wait four years and one day to file my lawsuit against you for that $1,000, you can file in your response, hey, Gruber waited too long. I don't have to pay her that $1,000. And guess what? You'd be right. Okay, so now we're to our last goal here. Let me just go back to our beginning. We've talked in the first two, excuse me, we taught in the first lecture, we talked about an introduction to contracts. We talked about the components or the elements of contract law in our first lecture. In our second lecture, we've talked about the UCC. We've also kind of talked in more general terms about contract law a little bit. And now we're moving to our last topic, which is preventative approaches that we can use to reduce the chances of us having uh, a breach of contract situation or a contractual dispute. So let's go to this last section of our chapter. Okay, so what are some strategies that we should consider following in order to reduce the chance of our dispute? In our first lecture, I talked about why we're so concerned about reducing um, the chances of a dispute. So I'm not going to go over that again. We're just going to talk about some of the strategies that may make sense. We've talked about some of these already, but let's just reiterate. We want to reduce that contract to writing. That reduces the chances of misunderstanding, ambiguity, um, people being dishonest. Another thing about reducing things to writing is that when people write, they are usually more careful because it, it's a conscious process. And so I mean, let's say we're talking about um, um, I'm going to paint your barn, for example, and you're going to pay me $1,200 to paint your barn. Um, when we're just talking about it uh, without reducing it to writing, we may leave a lot of questions not answered. But when we start reducing it into writing, then we start thinking, well, what color am I painting it? Well, what quality of paint am I using? Well, do, do I need to put some kind of primer on before I start painting? Uh, what about if there are any rotten wood um, that, that need to be replaced? Who's going to be responsible for that? Who's going to pay for that? Um, what if there needs to be, what, what am I going to do about the trim work? Does the trim work get painted a different color? Um, are we painting the inside? Are we painting the outside? So you can see all the different issues that come up that you want to make sure you nail down. Well, you could nail all those things down in an oral contract, but number one, people might forget the details. But number two, people just don't think when they're talking uh, to be careful about dotting every I and crossing every T. But when you write it down, guess what? You do have the I's to dot, you do have the T's to cross, and so you oftentimes get a much more tight document that addresses more question, addresses more of the questions that you need to, to resolve. And the more questions you can resolve to your document, the less ambiguity that exists, the less uncertainty, the less likelihood that there will be a differing difference of opinion between the two contractors. 
You obviously want to read the contract thoroughly. This is important if you're being presented with a contract from somebody else. Do you actually agree to these terms? Make sure before you sign on the dotted line. Um, obviously, if somebody else is drafting the contract for you, you'll want to read through it carefully. You want to keep copies of the contract documents so that you can refer to them regularly. And you also want to make sure that the right people are having access to the contracts. For example, it might be that, uh, let's say you're entering into a contract, we'll get, uh, go back to the bride and group scenario, and they want certain things to be done with respect to the food service. Well, if you keep that contractual information but don't share it with your kitchen staff, they won't know that um, this bride and groom want, um, they, they want the food to be kosher. And so they don't want there to be any bacon or um, any cheese on the meat or things along those lines. If you don't tell the, the kitchen, they won't know that. And so you might have that information, but if you don't share it with the right people, then you're not, you're, you're potentially going to be in breach of contract. You also want to make sure that the information in the contract is presented to the right people in a way that those people are going to be able to process it and understand it. If the contract is 100 pages long and you present that to your chef, he or she isn't going to be able to read a 100 page long contract. Um, so you'd want to just give that person the part of the contract that's relevant to his or her role in the situation. And you'll also want to present it in a method that, or format that's going to make sense. Um, let's say this, this chef isn't familiar with the kosher requirements that this uh, couple would like to have applied to their food. Well, you'd want to specify kosher means no bacon, kosher means no pork products, kosher means no combining of cheese and meat, kosher means no shellfish. You know, whatever those specifics are to make it just as clear as possible so that the chef doesn't have to Google the terms and figure out exactly what was meant. Um, and maybe kosher means something specific to this couple that might be slightly different than what it might mean to a different couple. So you'll want to uh, make sure that the right people know the right information at the level that's going to make sense for them to know. Okay, uh, then you want to use good faith when negotiating contracts, and this applies to both sides, um, the good faith requirement. Unlike mo many of the issues that we'll be talking about in, the, in this uh, chat, in this, not chapter, in this um, course, uh, contracts are not an adversarial situation. The parties both are, are, are entering into this in, usually in a goodwill type of, of spirit. I want to sell my car to you. You want to buy my car. We're both happy with that transaction. There's no animosity. There's no unpleasantness. I mean, you'd rather pay less and I'd rather get more. So there's some tension, but for the most part, it's a it's a, two people getting something that they want out of that transaction. And the law recognizes that this is different than the car accident case or the, um, the defamation case or the, uh, the, the situation where there's a inherently a conflict in the relationship. And so the law puts on both contractors or all contractors the obligation of good faith. When I negotiate, I need to act in good faith with respect to the other side. I need to, to be honest with that person. I need to say what I'm going to do and what I can't do. I can't misrepresent what I'm selling or things along those lines. That would be a breach of the contract. And then, of course, in any contract, you're going to want to specify when things are supposed to happen. You'll want to calendar it so the people in the kitchen know when they need to prepare that salmon. So the, when the, uh, the, the housekeeping department knows when to prepare the rooms for, for this and that event. Um, so that not only you're calendaring it, but you're passing that information on to the right people so that they will know when they need to accomplish those tasks. Many times, um, this is especially true in the hospitality industry, is that you may be responsible for third parties and their level of compliance. For example, maybe in that um, uh, reception hall that the uh, uh, bridal couple is uh, renting, uh, you have been responsible for providing um, entertainment. You have hired a third party uh, DJ uh, to play the types of music that the bride and groom would like to be performed. Well, um, this, this DJ does not directly work for you, but you, you, you found him to be or her to be a good uh, DJ and popular with, with the, the many, many brides and grooms. And so you, you've got a good, good connection, maybe that this bride and groom are out of town, so they weren't able to listen to the, the DJs themselves. Um, you'll want to make sure that DJ is there. Even though he doesn't or she doesn't work for you directly, um, if, if that person uh, doesn't show uh, because you have ensured that they are supposed to be there, 
um, that's part of the contract, then you can be in breach even though you yourself didn't do anything in violation. We've already talked about educating the, the staff about what they need to know. Resolving ambiguities as quickly and fairly as possible. You know, if we had an infinite number of resources to write the perfect contract, we'd never face an ambiguity. But none of us live in that perfect world. We do face con contracts with ambiguity. We want to reduce as much of that as we can when we're drafting the contract, but the reality is there's always going to be some ambiguity. We are just going to have to live with that. And when we find those incidences, it's better to confront it as soon as possible and be as pro oriented to solving the problem as we can under those circumstances. So let's say that the, the bride and groom said they wanted salmon for their uh, entree, but you didn't specify how large the fillets were going to be. Um, the, the bride and groom were expecting 12 ounce fillets. You were planning on serving seven ounce fillets. Um, they find out they consider that a breach of contract because they think 12 ounces is the industry standard. Um, you think it's uh, seven ounces. You may want to share information about uh, what is done. So you might want to uh, uh, canvas other uh, hotels in the area to see when they serve salmon, what size fillet they use. And so simply providing information to the bride and groom may be sufficient to persuade them that, yeah, seven is the industry standard. Um, but you also may want to compromise. You want to have this couple having a good experience because they may talk up your hotel and your uh, uh, your facility as in a positive way, which may result in more business. And so, you know, you may say, okay, you know what, we were expecting seven ounces, but we're willing to go to 10 ounces or something like that um, in order to resolve the dispute. So problem solving is definitely uh, something to uh, be aware of and to expect to do many times in contracts. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a reservation policy. Of course, this is a big issue in hotels. How are you going to um, uh, make sure that uh, people who make reservations actually honor the terms of the reservation? Uh, this is obviously a major issue for hotels. Back in the day, let's go back maybe to 1950, there was a really different environment. Um, uh, many people didn't have credit cards. Um, and certainly there weren't things like faxes or um, uh, the internet, and so the ability to send credit card information, even if they had it, was limited. So uh, many times people made reservations, but it wasn't backed up with any kind of financial uh, uh, connection. So they were not um, guaranteed reservations, meaning that if the person didn't show up for the reservation, that the hotel had the ability to charge the account. But nowadays, again, because of technology, the vast majority of reservations are going to be guaranteed, meaning that um, the, uh, th there's been some type of prepayment or payment authorization. And so when Bob reserves a room for Tuesday night with his credit card and he doesn't show up, well, guess what? Bob's credit card is going to be charged for the room anyway. This is what hotels want. They want their rooms to be guaranteed because that removes the risk for them. Um, because obviously, obviously when Bob doesn't show up, if there, his hotel room hadn't been guaranteed, um, but the hotel reserved it for him, and then somebody else came in, hey, I need a room. Well, I'm sorry, we don't have any openings. And then Bob doesn't show up. Well, uh, they've lost the ability to charge for that room when it's a non-guaranteed reservation. So you want to as much as possible as a hotel uh, manager to make sure that you get as many of your reservations to be in the guaranteed category versus non-guaranteed category. When you have a non-guaranteed reservation in that situation, you're probably not going to be able to collect from the no-show. I mean, the, the cost of suing that person, even if you can figure out who that person is, are going to be very limited. They're probably not local, so you, you wouldn't be able to sue them at their, you know, where, where your hotel is. After all, most people don't uh, rent hotel rooms in the towns where they live uh, under most circumstances. And uh, the, the amount at issue would be so small, typically just a few hundred dollars, that the cost of litigation would be more than what you would actually expect to recover from that. So uh, you don't want to keep, you don't want to have non-guaranteed reservations. In situations where you might find that you are, have accepted a non-guaranteed reservation, um, you may want to be more flexible about whether you hold that reservation for as long. Let's say somebody does come in, your hotel is sold out, 
um, you have somebody who's willing to pay right then for it, and yet you have this un a non guaranteed reservation. Well, you may want to consider hmm, uh, do I want to uh, honor the non guaranteed reservation or get, rent out the room to somebody else? Part of this is going to turn on um, how you confirmed the reservation because we're assuming whether it's guaranteed or a non-guaranteed reservation, you have some kind of confirmed reservation. Uh, so what is a confirmed reservation? Well, it's a contract to provide a reservation in which the guarantee provides, to me the provider, the hotel, guarantees the, the guest reservation will be honored into a mutually agreed agreeable time. A confirmed reservation may be either guaranteed or non-guaranteed. So let's say Bob has, has, uh, has a non-guaranteed reservation, but it's a confirmed reservation. It's supposed to be available until 6 p.m. It's 6.01 p.m. Larry walks in. He wants to rent the room. Bob isn't here yet. You know what? I'd suggest you let Larry rent the room uh, because the confirmed period for the reservation is now over and you don't have a guaranteed uh, way to collect payment from Bob if Bob never shows. This all turns uh, uh, on uh, a, a tension that exists in the hotel industry and that uh, tension has to do with contract capacity. Um, let's say you have a hotel <clears throat> where you have 100 rooms available to rent out every night. If you only are able to rent out 90 of those rooms and those 10 rooms that were empty last night, there's no way to recoup that loss. You can't rent out that room twice tonight to make up for it because guess what? Uh, the people who you're renting to now don't want to share the room with a stranger, right? So once you don't rent that room for a particular night, it's lost forever you can never get that back. So one of your goals as a hotel manager is to get as many of those rooms rented as you can. Um, and of course, one way about working with that is to use the guaranteed reservation system um, to, to get you to as close as possible to that maximum capacity. That's what you want. Um, and so figuring out what your contractual capacity is, how many rooms you're going to have available at a particular time, and how your, your reservation system is going to support that is a major concern for hotel managers. Okay, let's talk about a, a, some specific, I guess just two specific contractual provisions. Obviously, there's lots of contractual provisions out there. These are just two relatively important ones that we want to touch on. One is the idea of having a choice of law or choice of venue provision. These are very common both in hospitality contracts and other contracts. What they do is they tell both parties where any lawsuit about this dispute needs to be filed. And typically, the, the person who originates the contract, who drafted the contract, is going to want to choose a place that's convenient for him or her, usually where their legal staff is located. Um, and then also, in addition to choosing, the, that's the venue where the lawsuit can be filed, you also want to choose the state law that's going to apply. Um, there may be particular issues or particular approaches that is uh, followed in your state, we'll say the state of Texas, might be different than another state. And so by explicitly stating that Texas law controls, you're uh, making it clearer to all parties how this case is going to be litigated, what laws are going to apply. And again, that's reducing that uncertainty that we were talking about earlier. It may be that Texas laws aren't any more favorable for you than some other states, but at least you know those rules and you can follow those rules. Whereas if you were to say, eh, well, who, what, whichever state rules apply is what will apply, well, you won't know that you're in compliance with those rules. So this makes things more clear to all parties. And this is a positive. These are going to almost always be enforceable, assuming that they make sense. Now, if you're a Texas corporation entering into a, a contract with an Alabama guest and you choose Nebraska law, the courts are going to like, well, what's the connection with Nebraska here? Um, that type of clause probably won't be enforceable. But assuming that you are one of the parties to the contract and you are choosing your own state's laws and a venue in your own state, it's very, very likely those provisions will be enforceable. Okay, let's consider a different type of contractual clause that exists in, in many contracts. And this is an exculpatory paw, clause. I'm sorry, not pause. <laughs> um, these are much less likely to be enforceable than choice of law clauses. Let's talk about the term exculpatory for a second. Um, 
Um, let's first all look at the definition, then we'll talk about the term in more detail. A clause that releases one of the parties from liabilities for his or her wrongdoings. Um, you may have heard of the expression, if you watch uh, uh, Perry Mason or Law and Order type shows, um, the term exculpatory, meaning exculpatory evidence. Uh, this would be evidence that tends to show that a person is not guilty. So an example of exculpatory evidence in a criminal case would be evidence of an alibi. If I were, say, if, if I had witnesses saying I was two states away at the time of the murder, um, then that would be exculpatory because I can't be two places at once. So if I was eating at the Applebee's in Wyoming at the time that Bob was being murdered in Alabama, um, I probably couldn't have done it. Uh, or another example of exculpatory evidence would be, say, on the murder weapon, um, somebody else's fingerprints were on it. That would point maybe to them being guilty and not me. So exculpatory evidence tends to show this person isn't going to be held responsible. Inculpatory evidence is evidence that tends to show this person is responsible. So an inculpatory piece of evidence might be if my, uh, if my fingerprints were on the weapon or if there was a, a surveillance camera that showed that I was uh, stabbing Bob with the knife you know, on the video camera at that time. That would be inculpatory evidence. So exculpatory evidence is evidence that's going to re release me from liability when I do something wrong. And you can see why the court system doesn't really like this. Because after all, if you do, if you do something wrong, you ought to be held responsible for it. Um, and so usually contracts that have exculpatory clauses in it, the courts are, uh, I don't say reluctant, that might be too strong, but look at those clauses especially carefully to make sure that they are um, reasonable under the circumstances. They're not automatically not enforceable. They oftentimes are enforceable, but the courts uh, look at it more closely than they would other aspects. Let me give you an example. Let's say that um, you, uh, you are a guest at my hotel and um, on the uh, contract that you sign, I say that no matter what happens to you while you're a guest at the hotel, the maximum amount you can sue me for is $50. So you sign the contract, you go to your hotel room, and um, you turn on the shower, you jump into the shower, and instead of there being water coming out of the pipes, there's acid coming out of the pipes. You're badly burned. You need a massive amounts of medical treatment. Uh, you have a lot of pain and suffering. You have to take time off from work. Um, it's a really bad situation for you. And um, so you sue the hotel. Hey, why are you having acid coming out of the uh, shower uh, shower head. That doesn't make sense. Um, and the hotel might say, well, yeah, you're right. We shouldn't have done that. We shouldn't have had asset coming out of the shower head. My bad. We're so sorry. Oh, but look, you have an exculpatory clause in your contract. So yeah, you can sue us for $50. Here's the $50. Good luck with that. Well, the court would very likely say, uh, that's not a really reasonable amount given the, the totality of the circumstances. And so the court might well not enforce all exculpatory clauses. There's still though a good idea to have, and there's several reasons why they're adv advantageous. For one thing, sometimes courts will enforce it. So that's one reason why they're good, obviously for, for the, uh, uh, the vendor, in your case, the business. Another thing that can be good is they can discourage people from suing. Um, probably not in the asset from the showerhead case, but if it were, say, a smaller thing, like let's say while I am in my bathroom, acid doesn't come out of the showerhead, but I slip on the linoleum or the tile in the bathroom and I uh, sprain my ankle. And so I have a medical bill of $400. Um, and I'm pretty upset about it, and I show my, my medical bills to the hotel. The hotel points out the exculpatory language in the contract and maybe gives me the $50. I may well kind of go about my business. Oh, well, okay, the contract says all I can sue is for 50 bucks. They gave me the 50 bucks. Um, okay, and they kind of go about their business. You may have seen, um, a lot of times I'll see this while I'm driving around, that there are these uh, trucks, oftentimes uh, uh, dump trucks or, or uh, uh, trucks that haul a variety of things, and they'll say something like, uh, stay 200 feet back, not responsible for damage to windshields or things like that. Of course, I always think when I see those signs, wait a second, to actually read the sign, I have to be closer than 200 feet, right? 
Um, well, those, those statements are not contracts. They, they claim to be exculpatory clauses, but the, the person on the road didn't sign a contract um, uh, on a, to, 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 to agree not to be within 200 feet. So they're not legally meaningful. But you know what? When you see that stuff, you kind of think, oh, well, they wouldn't put it on their vehicle if they couldn't enforce it, right? Uh, so there's that sense of, well, gosh, they, they must have some legal basis for that. So even though something came from their truck that uh, caused my windshield to, to spider up, um, I'm st I probably can't sue them anyway. So that's the idea sometimes behind an exculpatory clause. It kind of has a bit of a chilling effect upon litigation. There are lots of other contractual provisions, which we'll talk about in a subsequent chapter. Um, so this concludes um, our chapter four relating to hospitality contracts basics. If you have any questions about the content that we covered, please feel free to email me or stop by my office hours. I'll be glad to discuss these items in more detail. Um, thanks for your attention. It's been a pleasure spending this time with you. I hope you have a wonderful day.